Thank you. Thank you very much, John, <coughs> for your kind words and generous words and for your friendship. For the time we spent together in difficult moments and uh, for the contribution that you did uh, on behalf of the United States and this part of your long life as a servant, diplomatic servant of your country. It is uh, for me a great honor to be here. I like to thank the Academy, the American Academy, for inviting me to give this speech. My deepest uh, gratitude goes to Richard von Feisack. I would like to thank him uh, for his kind words and for his friendship. I will never forget uh, the times in, uh, I think it was 1990, 1991, when uh, in Seville we had a long, long day of lunch and words, conversation, and I learned so much from him at that time that I will never forget it. Well, uh, today is uh, it's a very important day for you also. This historical eve uh, and this historical year. Though it seems like uh, it's a long time. It's almost a, a short time in history that uh, since the time that the West in the east of Germany, who are reunited. You will celebrate this tomorrow, and I will join. I would like to join you, although I will not be physically here. Almost 25 years ago, the barrier dividing this very city finally fell, and this moment is really engraved in our collective history. But so much has happened since then. So much progress has been made. Berlin is now a prosperous, beautiful city in an economically strong and a steady country. But this metropolis, Berlin, has also seen terrible events. 75 years ago this year, World War II started claiming around 60 million lives in countries through Europe and in the world. World War I started exactly a century ago. Just yes, Berlin is a city that saw and lived the best and the worst of the 20th century. Today, as we watch uh, the news, we see the world again ablaze with crisis from Ukraine, from Ukraine, just about 1,700 kilometers from here to Iraq and to Syria. My dear friends, uh, I'm afraid we, we have not yet reached the end of history. This evening, I would like to, to take a look at our world today, which is changing at the speed of light. This world, which is radically different from the one this uh, divided city saw a quarter of a century ago. The barriers that separated us have disappeared. And instead, we, the citizens of the world, are connected to thousands of invisible strands, strands of interdependence. In this changing panorama, we may feel safe in our clean, <coughs> our small village, in our small town, in our thriving cities. But in fact, the forces that unite us and that have brought uh, progress and prosperity have also created new dangers. And so 
in this state of interdependence, we are on a constant search. And I would like to underline that, a constant search, the search for responsibility. Within this web of interdependence, I would like tonight to start our quest for responsibility. Where I try to argue, as interdependence grows, so must grow responsibility. One can quite simply not come without the other. It will lead to disaster and probably chaos. I will begin by asking how responsibility was constructed before. Then I will try to analyze the threats and problems we are facing today. And finally, we will turn to the cracks of the issue. And I will try to ask how can and should we construct responsibility in order to tackle the challenges we face today? The raw state of affairs in the world is well known. Let me explain the, in the following way. Today, we're still formally divided by state borders. These borders uh, were the delimiting elements in the traditional Westphalian order that originated back in 1648. For centuries in the West, Max Weber seemed infallible. <coughs> His definition of the state as holding the monopoly of the legitimate use of physical force within a given territory held true. But circumstances have clearly changed. However, both governments and their peoples have not yet accepted the momentous shift. We remain attached to our nation states and our borders. Some behave as if each country were still an impenetrable block acting on its own. But the truth is that the mass Weber were alive would no longer recognize the world of today. Things are no longer so neat or so neat and so tidy. Globalization has penetrated the state. It has changed its very nature beyond recognition of the Westphalian founding <coughs> father's thought. Various and perceptions have crumbled. The forces of global economy permeate every single border of this planet. Lehman Brothers showed very clearly and very painfully that no single country is an island today. For the moment, of Lehman's collapse did not just cause little ripples. It caused tsunamis, which hit the shores of every country on Earth. Today, some are claiming globalization is in retreat. I believe this is neither desirable nor likely. Globalization has brought us great progress. It has also turned our world from a collection of monolithic solid state, states to an incredible, fast-moving, and dense web of interdependent, interdependent actors. We are, in a way, all nodes in this huge net. And everything we do and everything we don't do percolates immediately throughout the entire net. This is the condition of interdependence which some will say took us by surprise on the eve of the global financial and economic crisis. To me, it is crystal clear. When interdependence is so high and any action or inaction has immediately effect across the globe, there is only one way to maintain stability and prosperity. That is for the states and all actors to assume their full global responsibility. And I'm afraid this is not a choice. This is a necessity. And I think it can be no doubt that the states need for, to take up active, responsible roles. 
At the UN in New York a few days ago, President Obama took the stand and called for collective responsibility. He identified uh, two main and immediate threats to the state <coughs> of the threat to the world order. The resurgence of great power strife and the cancer of violent extremism. At this very moment, uh, we are talking, a monstrous terrorist organization is raging through the Middle East, aiming to create uh, a territory of its own in defiance of the states we know today. It's taught in Iraq and Syria, ISIS is fighting with extremely bloody means to create its own caliphate. The organization already controls a territory, some say it is the size of Austria and Switzerland combined. And there are more fires all around us today. The terrible conflict in Syria has been raging for three and a half years now. Figures, three million people have fled from the bloodshed. Nearly 200,000 have died. In Ukraine, a country uh, in our borders, 3,000 people have died in the start of the conflict this spring. The international security crisis all around us, we feel it close. But it's not just that they are physically close. If you think about the next, it's only 1,700 kilometers from here. But we feel it also closer because the poles that rapidly threw out this wave of interdependence moves is moving at the speed of light. When economic measures are taken to stop Russia military advances, <coughs> Berlin and all of Europe feel it in their economies. When faraway conflicts uh, threaten our gas supplies, we shiver inside our own houses. No country is an island. Still in today's world, the issue affecting us lies not just in the realm of classical security. In the age of hyper-globalization, we also share other problems and I would like to get it and underline it, a thirst for global public goods. We know very good, uh, very well, who provides the local goods, the national goods, but who provides and who maintains the global public goods. Obviously, therefore, we need a system of collective responsibility. As we share our problems, we must share also the solutions. In centuries and times uh, before, it was easier to identify the locus of responsibility. In the 19th century, what we may call the Pax, Pax Britannica reigned. The UK, the Grand Empire, were there to ensure order. In the next century, the US took off and took over. Not only that, these superpowers, for their immense weight uh, in the world, earns them that title, constructed a specific world order. As Hedley Bull remarked, <coughs> world order does not naturally produce itself. Someone does. Up to now, what we may call the hegemon, uses its power to build a system of rules. After the destruction brought by the two worlds, in particular the second, the world gathered to build an architecture to keep the peace and maintain global stability. This blueprint for global governance includes structures such as the Bretton Woods institutions 
in the United Nations. But what was perhaps most important was that uh, states started to become accustomed to a certain way of solving problems. The brute military conquests of centuries before were slow to relinquish to the past. Multilateral dialogue became an important part of the process. Nowadays, however, the institutions have gone stale. New poles of power have emerged. We live in an age of multipolarity, and multipolarity is the antipode of global hegemony. And this, my dear friends, has severe consequences. Built as they were by the hegemon, hegemon of the time, the institutions of global governance have petrified a power structure which is no longer adapted to today's realities. And the conclusion is clear. The multilateral order created by global, global hegemons from the past is broken. The question is whether adapting the existing order will suffice. However, I believe uh, in common sense. And clearly, no one in their right mind would jump into a vacuum. Blowing up the system or neglecting its entirety is not a solution. John F. Kennedy once observed that peace and progress are, and I quote, based not on a sudden revolution in human nature, but on a gradual evolution in human institutions. This gradual but far-reaching evolution is what we need for our international system. For as Kennedy continued peace and progress are a process, a way of solving problems. Despite all of our difficulties of today, we cannot neglect this process. You know that peace uh, is under threat today, as I said, in many parts of the world. But I'm afraid the most important thing is we are seeing what I would call a state of exhaustion. It's not only some countries, the United States, which is tired and tried. The middle classes, which have always formed the powerhouse of our Western democracies, are struggling in the midst of a severe economic crisis. With all this weariness, and with the process we have in place to maintain peace and stability moving past the expiration date, who is going to take responsibility? Let's take a look together to the options. President Obama has just launched a complex coalition to bear down on ISIS. His policy choices are extremely difficult. Allow me to inject a short comment here from my personal spirit. As you many know, I work intensively in the Middle East in the past and remain deeply engaged uh, today. And uh, I can safely say that uh, one of the most striking features of the current situation in the Levant uh, is that there are no good option for solution. The option for tackling the problems in that region range from bad to worse. In addition, the US and its people are sick of wars after Iraq and Afghanistan. In general, Pax Americana, if I could allow me to use that terminology, it is, coming, is becoming too heavy to bear. This is not, uh, as some claim, because the US is becoming irrelevant. Not at all. In the second quarter of this year, the United States GDP grew over 4%. However, others are rising, and it is time to share burdens and responsibilities. Meanwhile, for the last six years now, and I go to the European Union, the European Union has been rather self-absorbed, to say the least. The economic forces attacking from all sides, the crisis with capital C, 
became almost the only priority. If we look at the East, China has risen, or re-risen, I would like to say, within the framework created by the West. However, it doesn't feel, and I like to say that after having coming back from China, they don't feel really represented there. Though its contribution to United Nations peacekeeping missions are substantial, China tends only to speak up internationally when national interest is at stake. Brazil or India or South Africa are a part of the new construction that we call the BRICS. They have recently launched their own development bank, an open revelation of their doubts about the system of global governance in which they grew up. This, to my mind, is a significant step. We are seeing the first concrete move by the emerging countries to shift the system of global governance to their own terms. But I have a skip over an important country, and this is Russia. After the fall of the wall and the crumbling of the Soviet Union, things were not easy, and we know, for Moscow. I saw this with my own eyes. I clearly remember the days in the snow when I negotiated with Primakov a very sensitive topic, uh, like the first NATO enlargement. We were very different. But at the end, we understood each other. Times are different today. Under the president, the current president of Russia, if I allow me to lend some words from my good friend, Strop Talbot, Russia has become a Hobbesian gladiator. It is a country which is simultaneously emerging and in some respects declining. This is a contradiction, and I know that. And I know, too, that these contradictions do not last. The resolution of this paradox lies first with the Russian people, but not only there. Through his action, President Putin may unwittingly be shooting himself in the foot. The only way for Russia to be an important player in today's world is for it to act rationally and to build a, sol to build a solid relation with its neighbors to the European Union. Russia is where East and West meet and where many interests converge. Across the Atlantic, the United States and the European Union share very strong values. But when it comes to Russia and its recent actions, we come to very similar conclusions of our analysis. However, there is one large difference in our relation with Moscow. While for the United States, Russia is another great power, for us, for the United European Union, we share physical borders with the, Russia, with the Russian giant. Our trade and our ties on trade are extensive, and Russian gas is the exclusive source of heat for quite a number of European Union homes. When dealing with the recent intolerable infraction of international law on the part of President Putin, we therefore need to continue to deepen our discussion across the Atlantic. We must understand the calculus underway on either side of the ocean in order to craft the most effective policy to engage with President Putin. But we must also, of course, attempt to understand the Russian secret. We cannot work without taking into account the full picture. Well, this uh, short uh, scan of the world reveals clearly that responsibility remains sadly, and very sadly, elusive. This is not only intolerable, but also unmanageable in a world where interdependence and globalization reign. I have said it clear before, as we're all so closely connected, both 
our actions and our inactions percolates immediately throughout the entire web of countries. Irresponsible action can be disastrous. And silence sometimes can be deafening. Here in Berlin, there's one great project that I would like to draw attention to, and I've been talking a little bit about, which is the European Union. And allow me to go a little bit deeper. The European Union is a magnificent, globalized cluster of countries. It is a microcosm where we pursue unity in freedom, in peace, in diversity, all of this through openness, and integration. Within this microcosm, just as at the global level, there is a need of responsibility. In leaving a small portion of sovereignty behind, there is a great potential for collective responsibility. But this can go both ways. When states cooperate, their actions are strengthened they can take back great responsibility, both inside and to the rest of the world. But there is also a great potential for collective irresponsibility, just at the global level. And the term is, is well known, what we used to call free riding. In large groups, it is always easy to duck down and hide within the crowd. Taking up responsibility here that is poking your head out above the quiet masses is a risky undertaking sometimes. And at this point, it's important to distinguish, as uh, Klaus Hoffer did here not long ago, between causal, causal and remedial responsibility. Let me take the example of the Euro crisis. One thing is uh, who is responsible for the crash, and many thinkers have been pointed at the analysis uh, will go on after the crisis has been tamed. And this, to my mind, is the search for the causal responsibility, cost, who is the cost. However, another thing entirely is who is capable of solving the problem and who is thus responsible for solving it. This is the second type of responsibility, the remedial type. And let me speak uh, plainly. Europe has seen solidarity in these years of crisis. It might not have been as much as we expected or some expected, and may not be, uh, may not be as rapidly as some would have liked. But there has been an undeniable effort to help those in difficulties on the part of the European Union and by some of its countries in a more healthy economic position. And some numbers are revealing. Let me share it with you. The financial assistance the European Union and other institutions committed, let's take an example, to Greece, represented 117% of the country's GDP. You take uh, Portugal, it was about 45%. You take Ireland, it was about 41%. And you take Cyprus, 56% of the GDP. It's a great effort of solidarity. Now, clearly, taking up remedial responsibility can be an unhappy task. It may be a task not requested. A country who has become the economic powerhouse of the Union through happy fortunes and good leadership may find itself leading where it had not expected to do. Let me go to Germany. As the storm winds of the economic and financial crisis buffeted the European Union, Germany has been a steady ship let us be clear, at least from my side. Europe needs Germany. It needs Berlin not only to level the right, uh, in the right direction the economy, but also to stimulate it 
because Europe and the world need growth. And so Germany has effectively become the European Union driving force. Moreover, these positions, wanted or not wanted, has also put you at the collective view help in foreign policy. <clears throat> Henry Kissinger, that has been mentioned already, recently wrote uh, that foreign policy is not a story with a beginning and an end, but a process of managing and tempering ever-recurring challenges. Today, as I described before, there are many of those challenges to manage. And Germany is well positioned not only to engage in this process, but in fact to lead, and to lead it within the European Union. Traditionally, understandably, Berlin has been soft-spoken on the foreign policy front. The German public has been reluctant to get involved in foreign affairs. But now, my friends, the European Union needs Germanys and German leadership in order to give energy and a true energy to the European foreign policy. The world badly needs responsible action, and Europe can only deliver it with Berlin active engagement. Let me put it simply. We need German leadership in the European Union in order to achieve European leadership in the world. Allow me, however, to add uh, a nuance. Though it might seem so, leadership is not a lonely task. In fact, in taking up the role to move the European Union foreign policy forward, dealing with the crisis around us, it will also be critical to recuperate some of the fundamental axes of the European Union. I would like to mention today the axis between Paris and Berlin. This uh, relationship between Berlin and Paris has been fundamental and uh, form a centerpiece of the European Union machine. As your foreign minister from Walter Steinmeier said today in the uh, OPEP uh, recommended in Le Monde, if France uh, and Germany do not march together or not march together in the same direction, things will be much more difficult to be resolved. In bridging the distance between these two cities and involving all the 26 cities of other capitals, we are able to speak, we will be able to speak with a strong voice and a clear voice. Berlin today is at the heart of the European Union, and here and now I speak to you at a time of opportunity for the European Union. After many very difficult years, of economic crisis. Maybe we are seeing the end of part of the, of the crisis. And I think that the new, uh, newly reconfigured uh, European Commission, which is taking its place now, its president put forward as a democratically elected parliamentary for the first time, the new commissioners are ready to take charge and bring us forward. I think that all around us, including Frankfurt, including the bank, through our, our immediate neighborhood, we see challenges, but also possibilities to move forward. But again, with every challenge comes an opportunity. With the renewed institutions in place, we have the chance to put the European Union back on a solid footing to face the future and to be a positive force in the world. Both in the United States and the European Union, I think that the global economic crisis had lowered the volume of our global voices. And uh, for some time, we have been listened with less volume. Now, it seems to me, John, that Washington must be smiling. The United States have been listening hard to the European voices in international affairs. And they may finally have recovered the European ally they had been want wanting for, or waiting for. Together in this environment where new powers rise up, speak up, in this world without referees, 
our collective voice rings so much louder. As I said earlier, the European Union and the US share values, system, and framework, framework for analysis. We share a strong institution and are negotiating new ones. The TTIP uh, is an important one, which are meant to provide a well-needed boost to the world economy. We already, it's good to remember, trade goods and services worth 2 billion euros every single day. Yet for the last six years, the emerging economies, and this is also important to remember, provided 80% of the global GDP growth. If we're all to move forward, growth must emerge from all sides, developed and emerging countries. But there is more. As with any other country, we also share the skies, and thus the problem of climate change. Just 10 days ago, hundreds of thousands of people marched through cities in many parts of the world, asking their government to take action against climate change. The historical responsibility for the problem lies with the industrialized countries. Of that, I don't think we have any doubt. However, just recently, it was revealed that the emerging economies are improving their carbon efficiency much faster than we do. Still, even at that rate, this decrease in carbon efficiency is some four times less, four times less, what is required to keep climate change to manageable levels. I don't want to spend much more. Climate change is one of the most obvious examples of interdependence. And uh, without that concept in mind, it will not be resolved. Next year, we will have uh, an important meeting in Paris where I hope that important steps will be taken to put in the right direction the solution of this problem. Let me try to conclude with something I have been reflecting on for a, a while now. Looking at the crisis around us today and the actions and the inactions of states, I feel the world is on an impossible path. We seem to be on the way to a world which no longer exists, or actually one that never did. Certain states seem not only to be longing, but actually acting as if we could return to the age of the balance of powers. The age where great powers rule the world, or they are part of the world disregarding all others in their moves and policies. But there is no returning to that world. That door is closed. That world does not exist. Today, though, they are often battered and in need of renovation of our institutions. But we have still some fundamental international norms in international institutions that may guide our actions. Moreover, there are ties uh, between all of us that no one can break loose from. And this is the condition for interdependence. The return to the dynamics of great powers is thus conditioned by globalization and for the effects of globalization. They have or should have an impact on every single calculation we make. In this context, we cannot remain egoistic. We cannot be gay, we do not continue to be with our eyes closed. Taking up responsibility is imperative. We must then move forward and not back. We must keep adapting to confront the problems of today, rather than looking back with nostalgia at the models of the past. Let me draw clearly the path forward. We face a paradox today, no doubt. Our states are weaker, or at the very least, they are more porous uh, due to globalization. But at the same time, globalization and interdependence require those same states 
to take up more responsibility. And here is a paradox. There is only one, one way forward to move uh, past this contradiction, or potential contradiction. That is global cooperation. And this can only be achieved in each uh, and every state consciously accepts their context and assumes their global responsibility. But there is a little bit more. In this multipolar age, making progress in global cooperation requires a new mindset. No one power can impose their singular principle or modus operandi. If we want to move forward collectively, we must defend our principles while respected and understand others. Constructing, leading, and incentivizing responsibility is not easy. But to say the very least, uh, it's not impossible but with commitment and imagination. In the past, we have found solutions. And I'm pretty sure we will be able to do it again. Here, in particular, I'm convinced that both the European Union and Germany within must show their maturity and their experience. We are, moreover, at the right moment to do so. Our civilizations may be old, but our governance structures are innovative. The new structures in the European Union, the new Commission, the new Parliament, are occupying these structures and just getting ready to start in the coming days. On their tables, they have unique toolboxes. I am convinced that they will be able to use it properly. To conclude, the picture I've painted uh, may at times seem grim, and the homework uh, I have assigned heavy. But I'm an optimist, and I know that uh, interdependence offers both challenges but also opportunities. And each one of us is an inextricable node in this globe, or this globalized network and we must all think globally. We must gaze far beyond our own borders, out over the entire gleaming web where actions spread in the blink of an eye at the speed of light, and we must act accordingly. That is, we must act with responsibility. Globalization has brought us much progress. It's thus high time to forgo archaic mindsets of conquest and self-interest. Only by cooperating and governing our networked world responsibly, we can realize its full potential and forge a more promising future for all of us. Thank you very much.